Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. The other day I was watching uh, the TV show The Good Place, and uh, Deb and I find it rather humorous and funny, and, and we enjoy watching it. But there came a line in it that struck me uh, as almost biblical. Uh, this line just came right out, and it was, Since we know the outcome of the afterlife, we should be bold in making sure we get people in the good place. Since we know the outcome of the afterlife, we should be bold in getting people into the good place. Wow. Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we be bold about, I mean, it, as Christians, we know the outcome of life and where we will end up. Shouldn't we be bold in what we're doing to make sure everybody Here's the gospel message. The amen is the appropriate response right now. Amen. Bill's not here today. He had eye surgery. He's my go-to amen in the back row here. So you guys are going to have to pick up the slack today. So let you know right now, you need to practice amen. Amen? Amen. 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 You guys are on it. All right. Okay. So, but I will tell you this, in being bold and in making that determination and deciding to do that, it means that we may be called away from being comfortable and happy. And, amen, yeah. <laughs> we may be called away from comfort and happiness, but we will be called to something even greater. We'll be called in many times to discomfort into hard times. And I'll tell you right now, I'm the first one who does not want to sign up for that stuff. I am interested in being comfortable, uh, having steak potatoes and bluebell. Amen. Amen. So, Okay, I'm preaching to the choir now for sure. So that's what I'm interested in. But since we know the outcome, should we not be bold? And so here we have, uh, today's readings were rather long. Uh, and of course, you know who gets it whenever we have a long reading, right? I didn't even have to look. I know who's going to get this. And I shortened it, it the, the liturgical readings. But we have Paul... And we have the wise men. And in these stories, does there look to be anything comfortable at what, what they get called to? The, the wise men load up on camels and they go on a long journey. Uh, and there's some reports that it was about year two before they get there. So there was a long period of time. They loaded up. They went on a long... Anybody here been on a six-month camping trip before? Does it sound like fun? Yes, there's a kid here somewhere, right? He's ready to go camping for six months. I know some people who can arrange it. <laughs> and then Paul, he gets called to travel. If you read the journeys of Paul, it is epic, the difficulties he goes through. So there are difficulties and callings, and they are called out in the midst of this, and they leave behind comfort, they leave behind their homes, they leave behind all of this, and they go and do difficult. And we are called to the same things. But I want to point out something that's very interesting about the story of the wise men versus Paul. It has to do with my sermon titles. Uh, the wise men were outsiders who were called to come in. And Paul was the ultimate insider called to go out. Do y'all get that? The wise men were outsiders, and they may look like, because we always like, we, we, we end up with a nativity, and we always have three wise men, and we got some camels. So they look like they're part of the scene to us. But they would have showed up, and they would have been in the wrong clothes. They would have looked like somebody from out of the neighborhood. They were the, the outsiders. And Paul was, of course, the Jew of all Jews, uh, and I'm quoting scripture there, and he is the ultimate insider. So I, I want to kind of ask you a question here. Are you more comfortable being an insider, or are you more comfortable being an outsider? Insider, yeah, that's where I, I'm more comfortable being an insider and being on the in and being on the, the no, as opposed to being an outsider having to find my way into things. I am much more comfortable one way or the other. Now I want to make sure I get my stories in the right order, so let me look. 
You know, when I was um, in banking, I, I, I drove a 1971 convertible uh, Oldsmobile white on white with a blue interior. Now, I'm telling you this story because it was not the 70s when I was doing this. <laughs> now, what was interesting about it is pretty much most of the employees knew which car I drove because it was very distinctive. And I was on a team that did acquisitions of other banks. So if you saw my car parked in the parking lot for like a week at a time and never going home, and then you saw it the next week and it didn't go anywhere for a week, it wasn't because it was broken. It was because we were out looking at acquiring other banks and I was uh, flying somewhere and I was on the team and we were looking at buying something. So I would finally get back to the office and we would be having lunch with people and they go, so who are we looking at buying? And of course, I couldn't tell them because we were publicly traded. That would be insider information. And being that I don't like going to jail, I'm not talking. But it is much more comfortable to be the one who has the information about what's going on in an organization than it is to be the outsider who doesn't know the information. And so I always found it much more comfortable. It also feels like a little bit of power and authority. Anybody else there with me? Just nod gently. This doesn't require a big amen. And then one day, while we were out looking at purchasing a bank, we received a phone call, and we had been sold to another bank. <laughs> it's appropriate to yell out of the back, help him, Jesus. <laughs> to go from being the insider to being the outsider. It's not a feeling you often forget, is it? Uh, it, it is not a feeling that's very good. To go from being one who had the information, and, and you know, this was important information. It was going to affect a whole lot of things, and it did. So I want to look at the scriptures today and talk just a little bit about our insiders and our outsiders. Our wise men were the ultimate outsiders, and what's really kind of interesting about outsiders, when you invite them in, whenever they show up, they wreak havoc. We just had our, all of our children and grandchildren at the house, honey. Did we have havoc? A little havoc, a little havoc. We had about 14 people at the house. And whenever you invite a lot of people, and they're family, <laughs> right? But whenever you have outsiders come in, there is some havoc. So when we look at the story of the wise men, they show up in town, and God bless their heart, that's what we say in East Texas. God bless their heart. They show up and they go and they do not know that who they're not supposed to talk to is Herod. So what do they do? They wander into town. They talk to the wrong people. They are honest. They try to find out kind of where this new king is being born. And when they do, if you may have missed this in the scripture, it not only upset the palace, it upset all of the region. You see, something was going to change. So whenever outsiders come in, then all of a sudden things get turned over and they kind of get fruit basket flipped. And you know what? That can happen in a church as well. Uh, you start having outsiders start coming into a church. Uh, they may be a little bit like the wise men. They show up wearing the wrong clothes. <laughs> They, they, they may have their hair dyed a different color. Ooh. <laughs> you know, and at my age, if I had hair, it might get colored. <laughs> and so they, they wander in, and then they don't know the ongoing long stories as to all the issues that are going on in the church. And so they may mess things up. There's kind of a really funny story. This isn't in the sermon, so it's a bonus story today. About a preacher who gets assigned to a new church. Have I told this one here? You don't know enough yet. So he gets assigned to a new church, and their longtime music director had just passed away, and they had bought him a piano, and he was beloved. And they had the piano right where the altar goes, and they had the altar right where the piano goes. And so his first week he was there, he moved them where they go. And the next week, they had a new preacher. <laughs> So 
So anyway, about a year later, he comes and visits. And as he's visiting, everything was where it should be. The piano was over there. The altar was over here. And he asked the preacher, how did you move it? And he goes, an inch a week, baby. <laughs> Outsiders don't know. They come in and they tell truth and they look and they see. If you watch situation comedies, situation comedies are almost always based on an outside cultural person being placed in the middle of a culture. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? You, you often have a person of one culture stuck in the middle of another culture and they point out the hypocrisy of what's going on in the world. It's a dangerous job. But it's also a place, and we need to realize that these wise men were bringing gifts. That often the outsiders who come in bring gifts of freshness, they bring gifts that bring in new life, and they bring gifts that often change us. And so in a way, the outsiders come in and they are invited in. Now we have our friend Paul who is the ultimate insider. And so he gets invited by God to what? He wants to go to all the Jewish people, but God says, no, what I have as an assignment for you is to go to all the outsiders, to all the Gentiles. And thanks be to God, he goes to the Gentiles, because guess what, folks? We're the Gentiles. We're, we are the outsiders. So Paul is sent out. Now, what's interesting about being an insider sent out is guess what you get to do? You get to learn the outsider's culture. You get to go and learn to eat the food they eat. So for Paul, he began to have a pork sandwich and maybe some shellfish. And being good Southerners, we are ready for some good pork barbecue and maybe some sweet tea, right? So Paul gets exposed to all these things and he goes out and he has to find out what their problems are, what their issues are, and he is called outside from where he has all of this knowledge. And then he says something very interesting in scripture. He said it was a gift from God that he was called to do that. That God gifted him in the ability to go do that. And you know, I, I don't think that we often understand the difficulties and the trials and the hard things that God calls us to are a gift where we are perfected. Where God calls us to be changed and, and rubs off the edges out of us. And so Paul is called out into this world and he goes and does this. I think often within eclectic communities, you know, we, we would prefer to be with our affinity group, the groups we like, the people we know, the people we were excited to be around. In, in fact, yesterday uh, I was out at the airport, and you, if you're Facebook friends with me, you saw this. Uh, there was a guy there with a uh, helicopter, and he invited to give us a tour. And as an airplane guy, guess what I said? Oh, yeah. You know, when we have similar interests, these are the things that really draw us. But the things that really grow us are often being with people who are not exactly like us. And so God may put us in groups that are a little different so that we may be changed. And so Paul is called into that group. So why? Why in the world should we do this? Uh, number one is because God called us to do this. Uh, Epiphany this season is about uh, that Jesus came down and was recognized and that he was coming and reaching into the world. So we are emulating God and what God called us to do is to go and reach the outsider and for us as insiders to go and be outsiders. So just the fundamental reason of because God called us to. And, and number two, Uh, and I just went over it right before this one, was, is, is the eclectic groups call us into transformation. In, in being exposed to people who are different than us, it, it is many times the gift that transforms and changes us. So I really want to just tell two stories, and then we'll have communion. Um, when I first became a, a pastor... Uh, we go annually to a thing called annual conference. And, and I want to just confess this to you right now. The, uh, the first annual conference I went to was at the Woodlands, and it was full of preachers. Okay, because that's who they invite. 
And I was brand new at this preaching thing. I was an associate, and so I went to annual conference. And, it, and as I went, I want to let you all in on a secret. Preachers be weird. <laughs> and when you gather, I got a family here who knows. <laughs> And when you gather a group of them together, if they weren't weird before, you put a whole group of them together. So I go to this big annual conference, and I don't know, I almost know nobody. And so I go to the Woodlands United Methodist Church. There's thousands of people there. And then they have strange meetings. Uh, and you go to these strange meetings, and worship is different, and everything is different, and you don't know anybody, and you feel like the ultimate outsider. And, and I want to be really honest, after I had gone and done this, I want you to know, if it wasn't a requirement for my job, I would not have gone back. <laughs> Just being honest. If it wasn't, I mean, it was like, what's in your job description? You got to go looking for loopholes. But now that I've gone year after year and I've made friends and I've become an insider, I enjoy going to annual conference. Have there been places in your life where you have been the outsider? And how does it feel? It, it's not good. And what you're looking for is somebody, somebody to invite you in. Somebody to be there with you. Somebody to hold your hand and, or, or hold your elbow or just to offer you a cup of coffee or water. Uh, the second story is, while at Kingwood, I received a phone call one day. Um, well, before I get to the phone call, uh, we had moved there mid-year um, over the Christmas break. And Alex was mid-year ninth grade. So I want you to picture your in your ninth grade high school year, and you get invited to move to a brand new school that's really large. And we thought mid-year would be pretty good because then he would make friends before the summer came around. But at Kingwood, the kids already had been going to school together for lots of years. And there were an incredible number of cliques and closed off communities. And so he arrives and he had had a difficult time in making friends. It just was not the easiest time for him, and I felt bad for him, but there, there really wasn't anything I could do. Now, fast forward to the phone call. Uh, one day I received a phone call the, the next year, and it was the Presbyterian preacher who had just moved to town. And he called me and he said, I would like to invite you to lunch, and I need to bring you something, uh, and we need to meet, and we need to talk, and we need to talk about your son, uh, because I have his clothes and I need to return them to you, and we need to talk. I was like, great. <laughs> I don't know how y'all are feeling about this story right now, but I wasn't really, and I'm like, okay. And so we go and we meet for lunch. And he said, hey, here's your son's clothes. They're, 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 they're clean and they're ready to return to you. And he said, I, I want you to know that we had recently moved to town, and our daughter has had a real hard time making friends, and your son invited her to a party and had some extra clothes so that she could swim at the party. And he was there and invited her into it and introduced her to the right people and took time to make her a friend in this community. And he said, and I want to tell you, we've lived in some other places, and she has not always been involved with the right people. But your son invited her into the right group of people. And he wanted to tell me what an exceptional person I had. And I was like, whew. <laughs> you know, at that moment, you're like, uh, today is a good day. <laughs> so being a dad... I had to go home and ask my son, son, what were you thinking? Son, well, you know, hey, how, how, did, how did this happen? And, and so I had that conversation with him, and he told me something that was really important. He said, Dad, he said, I remembered what it was like to move here. I remembered what it was like to be the outsider. And he said, I promised myself I wasn't going to let anybody else live that. You know, this is an important message. 
that is insiders. And that's who we are here in the church, folks. We should not allow people to be outsiders. We should be welcoming. We should be inviting in. We should be there for them. And for this reason, because we know the outcome. We know the afterlife. And since we know, we should be bold. And we should be inviting people to the greatest life ever. And in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.